Before we talk about deconvolution, we really must talk about convolution. In reservoir engineering, we often have production data, so we know the rates. We feed that information into our reservoir model, and we can calculate the pressures corresponding to that rate sequence. That's called convolution. It's a direct process. In real life, though, we often have measured production data. We have the measured corresponding pressures, and what we're trying to do is extract the reservoir description from that information. That is deconvolution. It's an inverse process and has all the problems and limitations of all inverse processes. So in real life, what we have is data that looks like this. The pressure data are shown in brown and the rate are in green. And what we're looking for is something like this, which we will call a type curve and a derivative. And this shape here actually describes our reservoir characteristics. So this talk is going to consist of two parts. We're going to talk about the classical methods of deconvolution and then the modern methods. But before we talk about deconvolution, we must first define the unit rate function, which we call the type curve, and its associated curve, the derivative. We must understand that so that we can carry on with the rest of the talk. And then we'll describe what convolution is. Another name for convolution is superposition. In this talk, I'll use convolution and superposition interchangeably. They are the same thing. And then we'll talk about deconvolution, but first we'll talk about the direct deconvolution method, and we'll talk about its limitation. In part two, we will address the modern methods of deconvolution. Now, they are indirect methods. I'll give you live demonstrations of the process. We'll talk about the strength and weaknesses. And because deconvolution is likened to modeling in terms of determining the reservoir characteristics, we will have a section that talks about uh, comparisons of deconvolution and modeling. First, un the unit rate function. If we have a well flowing at a constant rate, we can calculate its pressure profile. So the pressure will decline with time. But more often in reservoir engineering, we're interested in the pressure drop, the delta P. So let's plot the delta P versus time, and that's an increasing function like this. Well, that's the pressure drop for a constant rate in this particular example of, say, 100 barrels a day. What's more useful to us is the pressure drop per unit rate. So let's take this delta P, which was for 100 barrels, and divide by 100, and that will give us the unit rate function. So what you see in the top green curve is what the pressure drop will be for each unit rate. What do we do with that? Well, we take that curve and we're going to plot it on log-log paper for convenience. We're not changing anything. We've already got the curve. All we're doing is plotting on log-log paper. And along with that, we're going to take the slopes of the curve when it's plotted on semi-log paper, so it's a little complicated, but we're going to generate the derivative. So these two curves come from the green curve up here. They are the same information. There's our type curve, there's our derivative. What do we do with all this? Well, this type curve of the unit rate function with the derivative actually are the fundamental curves for well test interpretation. Why? Because we use them for identifying all our flow regimes. We can tell you whether our data is in well bore storage, where the permeability can be calculated from, have we seen any boundaries, is it boundary dominated flow, what the damage is on the well, the skin, all this we can tell from the type curve. But I want to remind you that this type curve that we've just generated is for a constant rate situation. So that's the basis behind the unit rate function. What do we do when we have multiple rates? So if we're trying to solve a rate sequence like you see here, what we have to do is take that unit rate function and apply convolution or superposition to it. And I'm going to show you how that works. So we know this unit rate function, and we're trying to model the behavior of these multiple rates. But we don't have a multiple rate function. We only have a unit rate function. So we're going to use this to generate all these multiple rates. And how do we do it? Well, let's use what we know. We know the unit rate function, so we're going to take the first rate, take the delta P over there, multiply by 100, calculate the delta P that will be created by this rate of 100. So we can now generate this first part here. That's straightforward. It's the reverse of what we've just done. Now we come to the second rate. Well, we don't have this second rate function, 
So what we're going to do is pretend that second rate doesn't exist, and we're going to continue the first rate going forever. So that's easy for us to do because we continue this curve going forever. The same way as we generated this first part, we just continue that way. But at this point in time here, we're going to start not a new rate, but a new well. And the new well has a rate of 250 minus 100. But because it's a new well, and it's at a constant rate of 150, we have the unit rate function, but it starts at this time here, and now we can apply the same methodology again, but what we have to do is superpose it on this continuously declining pressure. So we're going to take the unit rate, multiply by 150 this time, and we're going to extrapolate this blue curve, which is the behavior of the second rate. When we come to the third rate, which happens to be a shut-in in this case, and we don't care whether the rates are flows or shut-in, we're going to continue the same thing. We will extrapolate the second rate, and at this point in time, we will start a new well, but this time the rate of the new well is 0 minus 250, so it's a negative rate, and because of that, the delta P's go up. The procedure is very straightforward and very simple. So what we've just generated from this unit rate function, the superposition function of the pressure behavior of the multi-rate situation. Mathematically, this is called convolution or superposition. In mathematical books, sometimes it can be called Duhamel's equation or the Faltong integral. In this equation, you have an integral here, but this is the unit rate function. That's that green curve that we had that we're working with. Often it has a mathematical expression. The equation here deals with continuously changing rates. If the rates are changing in stepwise, like we do in most well testing, then this integration sign becomes a summation, and we reformulate the equation this way. So this is our standard superposition equation. Now let's talk about deconvolution. Well, deconvolution, as you've guessed, is the reverse of this thing. What we have is production data, pressure and rates that look like this, and we're trying to extract this. This type curve and derivative, now you know why we need them, because they describe our reservoir for us. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to do it in the reverse manner that I've just described for convolution, but rather than show you a multi-rate situation, because it can get pretty complex, I'm going to show you just a flow and build-up situation. How do we do it? So. Here's our data. We've measured the flow and build-up. And what we're trying to do is we're going to use the reverse procedure and generate this unit rate function, the type curve, and its derivative. So that's what we're after. How do we do it? Let's start. There's the data that we have. In reality, what we're looking for is we've got the first part here. And then what we're looking for is the continuation of this. Because once we've got this, this is our single rate behavior. So how do we get this continuation? We don't have it. All we have is the build-up. So what we're going to do is, at any point, delta t here, I'm going to go to the drawdown part and determine what this is here, and transfer it from the build-up down to here, and I'm going to extrapolate this, and I continue this all the way to the end. So now, I've generated this single rate drawdown behavior. I'm going to take this green curve, plot it on log log paper, take its derivative, and there we go. There's my unit rate function. So that's deconvolution. What I've just described is fairly straightforward. For multi-rates, the process is the same, but it can get more complicated. This procedure is very direct. Given data, I can work backwards and get the answer. But there are some pretty serious limitations, and we're going to talk about them now. Well, the first limitation is that we must have all the pressure data available to us. Anytime there are errors, it's going to make things really bad because they propagate. Because we don't tolerate errors very well and the quality of the data becomes very important to us in this procedure, generally we'll only be able to use build-up data for this because drawdown data is often very noisy. And if we're using build-up data, we get more problems if we don't really know the initial pressure before the flow. And that happens very often too. And I'm going to show you that when we have missing pressure data, this procedure ends up with an information gap. There's nothing we can do about it. We're missing information. All the data must be available. Well, you just saw that here. How did we determine this extrapolation of the drawdown curve here? Well, we did it by taking the pressure during the drawdown and desuperposing it from the buildup over here. 
If we don't have the drawdown data, there's no way we can do this part at all. So you can see that we must have all the data for this process to work, for the direct process to work. I've suggested to you that errors are propagated and magnified, and in fact that's been part of the problem of why deconvolution has not been used over the years, because it's an unstable process, and I'll illustrate to you why that is so. Let's say we've done a two-rate test, and we've measured the pressure data, and the pressure data was perfect, except for this little glitch over here. So, we're now going to deconvolve this to get our unit rate function. So how do we do it? We need to extrapolate this part here, and the way we're going to do it, just like we did with the build-up, we took the delta P from the drawdown part, and desuperposed from the second rate, and we got this extrapolation here. Well, what you see is this single glitch that was over here, of course replicated itself over here, and this replicated itself over there, and over there, and over there, and so on. And when we plot the type curve and the derivative resulting from this, we get these multiple glitches over here. And this is with just one rate change. Anytime we have a rate change, we have furthermore extrapolation or propagation of these errors. So you can see why the process is relatively unstable. Introduce errors and uh, very often uh, the data cannot be deconvolved. And that's why over the past 50 years, deconvolution has not succeeded. Because of these inconsistencies in the data, often we'll only be able to use built-up data. Usually that's pretty good quality, and there are two situations we're going to talk about. It's one when we know the initial pressure, and the second case is when we don't know the initial pressure. So let's look at the case where we know the initial pressure. So we have built-up data. These are the four green points on the right here. The drawdown is missing, or it's poor quality so we can't use it. Let's assume it was there, but we can't use it. And we know the initial pressure. What are we looking for? We're looking for this unit rate function. What is the drawdown going to look like? Because now we can plot this on log log paper and get our uh, type curve and derivative. So that's what we're looking for. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to use deconvolution or desuperposition. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to assume the extrapolation of this single rate function. It's an assumption at this point. Well, once we've got this, we can desuperpose these measured build-up data. And of course, we can now plot them on the drawdown part here. And what we have, the solid green line, is our unit rate function. So it starts here, and it continues over here. In between, we don't know. So we're going to take this unit rate function and plot it on log log paper and plot the derivative. And what we're going to notice right away is there's a gap in information. There is no information in this gap. There's nothing we can do about it. We can't invent it. Or we can, but it isn't real. It's our invention. We must remember that. So let's concentrate on the type curve itself. Let's invent the data in between here. Let's assume it's this. Now, let's use this unit rate function, or this one up here, which is the same thing, and let's do a convolution of flow and build up. And lo and behold, it matches this data perfectly. Well, let's take a different interpolation between these points here. So let's say this new curve that I've drawn is my new tight curve, and I'm going to use it for convolving my flow and build up. And what do I get? I get exactly the same match. So which of these two is correct? Well, let's just take that one step further. Let's try a different guess at the extrapolation. So you can see what's happening. We can now create a new set of type curves here. And let's take another one yet. And now we can create yet another different set of type curves here. If we use any of these type curves, with whatever you want in between here, we will still replicate the true build-up data that we've measured. So you can see our problem. We can reconstruct the pressure history for any of these type curves exactly. And yet, the unit rate function that we're using is not unique. You see, we have the same problem as a lot of well testers have when they're using a model. You can use several models to replicate your data. Which one is correct? 
There's no answer. The answer will not come from the model. The answer has to come externally. We have to impose external information to help us decide which is the correct interpretation. So we have the same problems. And as soon as you introduce external information, now you're introducing your own bias into it. And that's good sometimes, but sometimes it's not good. If you don't really know what that external information is that you're introducing. Hopefully it will be a geological model. That's what we do in modeling. We introduce a geological information and we use that particular model to reconvolve or replicate our measured data. Well, let's look at the same thing, but this time we don't know the initial pressure. See what happens to us now. Well, here's where we left off when we knew the initial pressure, but in this example we don't know the initial pressure, so we don't know where this position is. I want to remind you about a couple of things. This first part of the data, where does that, or the type curve, where does that come from? Well, it comes from two parts. It comes from the extrapolation that we assumed, which is a function of t plus delta g, and also it comes from the actual measured data, which are these green points over here, which is a function of delta t. So that's what this part comes from. Where does the tail end come from? Well, this part comes purely from the extrapolation. That's all it is over there. So it's a function of t plus delta g. I want you to note as well that this point here actually comes from the flowing pressure before we shut the well in. And that this point here is actually PI minus P initial, or PI minus P flowing. So if we don't know what PI is, where is that point going to be? It depends where PI is. And at the same time, wherever PI is, that's where this line is going to come from. So this illustrates that when we don't know PI, the front part of the curve stays the same, but the back end here will move depending on what PI we assume for it. An added complication. So not only do we have a gap in the data, but we have a problem with the shape of the tail end of it. So this direct deconvolution process obviously has severe limitations and advantages. Let's review them. It's extremely sensitive to data quality, and that's why it's very hard to use on production data, but it's, it's got a chance of succeeding with build-up data. If we're missing the initial pressure, things can get pretty bad for us. The answers are non-unique. There are gaps in the data. We must use external constraints. Let's not forget that, because some of the visions that people have out there about deconvolution, especially about the modern methods of deconvolution, these external constraints, constraints are so hidden in the methodology that we forget that they exist at all, but they do exist. Some of the advantages are from multi-rate data, we can extract the type curve and the derivative, which is something we dearly love to have because that describes our reservoir for us. One great advantage of the deconvolution process, as opposed to modeling, we don't have to assume the reservoir model. If I know nothing about this reservoir model, I can deconvolve the data. Especially if I have all the flow and build-up data, I can deconvolve it. Now, if it doesn't deconvolve properly, that's a question of the quality of the data. But it's not because I don't know my reservoir model. But in modeling, you have to select, pre-select a reservoir model before you will do your modeling and convolution. So this is an advantage not to need to know the reservoir model. An additional advantage is, in normal build-up testing, what we usually investigate is the duration of the build-up. In, if we use deconvolution, we can investigate a larger radius investigation, and let me demonstrate that to you. In a build-up test, if we have a 10-hour build-up test, what we end up analyzing is 10 hours worth of a built-up type curve. In, if we use deconvolution, and we use all the rate history associated with it, we actually deconvolve and get the unit rate type curve for a longer period of time. So our radius investigation is increased. And that's a pretty nice advantage. So in conclusion, what we've talked about so far are the classical methods. They've been known for many years, but they have not been used successfully because of the sensitivity to data quality.